Hey, so today we're going to talk a little bit about why we need quantum mechanics. Now you might have heard before that one of the reasons we need it is because under classical mechanics the atom atoms that make up the universe would collapse and nothing would exist. So today we're going to look at a specific case of that. We're going to look at a hydrogen atom and actually calculate how long it would take for hydrogen atom to collapse. Because if all atoms collapse, but over the span of billions and billions and billions of years, it's not really a problem. And it would make sense that we're still here. Uh, however, we're going to see that it actually would collapse much more rapidly than that. So up here I have a diagram of the classical hydrogen atom. Uh, you have a proton in the middle and an electron orbiting around it. Um, and it's some distance we'll call r away. Uh, and I have the values that are going to be relevant to our math here. With the mass of the electron, uh, the const electric constant, of permittivity I believe, um, r, uh, the radius, will be 10 to the negative 10 meters, and the charge of the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, this here uh, is the Larmora formula, and it tells us that uh, the amount of change in energy over time, and you can see that it is uh, equal to uh, ch uh, charge squared times the acceleration squared over 6 pi epsilon naught c squared, where these values are all down there, except for pi, because you should know pi. So, uh, what we want to know to figure out how long it will take is we want to find out first how much energy does it lose each orbit. The Larmor formula doesn't tell us that, so we're going to have to find it on our own. So the period of the electron that it takes to travel one orbit around the nucleus, we're going to call it t. And it's going to be equal to the distance traveled by the electron, which is 2 pi r, that's just the circumference of a circle, divided by its velocity, v. Uh, but we don't have what the velocity of the electron is, so we're going to have to calculate that. So we are going to look at the forces that are applying to this electron. So the, the, really the only force which is on it that's keeping it attracted to the nucleus is the Coulomb, Coulomb force. Uh, and the Coulomb force is, uh, we'll call it F sub C, and it's equal to Q squared divided by 4 pi r squared epsilon naught. But, this doesn't have a v in it. So this is where we pull out our classical mechanics of rotating objects, and if an object is rotating around and being held in, then there's a centripetal force. So this force must also serve as the centripetal force in this equation, in this uh, system. So the uh, centripetal force of a rotating object uh, is equal to uh, mv squared over r. And here's our v, that's what we want. That's the velocity of the electron. So uh, we're going to have one of these r's are going to cancel, uh, and then we'll just take uh, multiply by the r, so we'll cancel that, divide by the m and take the square root of everything. And we'll find uh, that the velocity of the electron is equal to its charge divided by the square root of 4 pi epsilon naught m r. Lots of variables. So what is the actual number behind this? Uh, so if you plug in all the numbers from the, uh, the values from the numbers we have over here, uh, you'll find that the velocity is 2,250,558 uh, uh, meters per second. That's really fast, but it doesn't come close to the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Um, so, now we can find the period of the electron, since we have its velocity. So, again, we'll just plug everything in, and we'll find that T is equal to 2.79 times 10 to the negative 16th, and that's in seconds. So, as you might expect, it's traveling a very small distance at a very fast speed, so the amount of time it's going to take to do that is going to be very small. Uh, so now what we can do is, looking at this formula, the change in energy over the change in time. So change in energy, I'm going to kind of box this stuff off so you don't get confused. Uh, the change in energy, we'll just call some delta E, change in energy, divided by the change in time. Well, we'll start measuring at zero, so then the change in, ener uh, change in time will be T final minus T initial, which will just be T. So we'll have the change in energy over t uh, is equal to 
um, this here. So negative q squared a squared divided by 6 pi epsilon naught c squared. But we want to know how much energy is lost per each orbit. So the orbit here is a value for time. And we're going to put that in for the time value in the Lamour formula. So we're going to erase that, and we're going to put in here 2.79 times 10 to the negative 16th. And then we're going to solve for the change in energy. So basically, we're going to plug in all of our values here, and then multiply by that. And that will give us that the change in energy uh, for each orbit is equal to, um, let's see, 4 times 10 to the negative 24th joules. So this is a very, very small amount of energy for each orbit. Um, but we need to now find how, how much uh, energy it has total. So we know, if we know it loses this much energy per orbit, and we know the total amount of energy of the electron, then we can find how many orbits it will take for the electron to collapse into the nucleus. And we know the amount of time it takes to travel one orbit, so we can then calculate how long it will take to collapse into the nucleus. Now, notice here, we're going to neglect something very important. Uh, as the electron collapses into the nucleus, as it loses energy, it slows down. And as it slows down, it gets pulled more and more and more into the nucleus. But what we're going to do in this approximation is say that the radius doesn't change. That the electron rotates around and then stops. And we'll say at that point it instantaneously falls in. Now this might seem like kind of a ridiculous approximation, but the values here are very, very small. So if we make this approximation, it shouldn't hurt us that much in the end. And we're going to find out just how uh, to what degree it affects our answer at the end of this. So, uh, now its total energy, which we're going to call E, is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So that's going to be K plus U. And that, uh, K plus U, we know that K is going to be equal to 1 half mv squared, and U is going to be the Coulomb potential. So that's going to be minus q squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r. And again, this is, uh, earlier I mentioned the Coulomb force, right? And this looks very close to that, but you'll notice a factor of, of r is distance is different. This r is to the first power, and this one's squared. And the reason for that is because this is the Coulomb force, which is proportional to r squared, and this is the Coulomb potential, which is an energy. And um, the energy is the ne uh, sorry the force is the negative derivative of the energy. Uh, uh, sorry, other way around. The energy is the negative derivative of the force. Um, so you can see that here if you know about this. Um, so basically, we're just going to plug in all of our values for m, the mass of the electron, the velocity of the electron, which we found back there, the charge of the electron, pi, epsilon naught, and r, and uh, our answer for the total energy of the electron. Uh, it gives us is 1.15 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay. So this is good. So now I'm going to erase up here so we'll have some more room to work. But we're going to keep what's down there. And this is where a bigger whiteboard, bigger whiteboards are always good. But I've got a big one, so I won't complain too much. So we want to know the number of orbits that it will, the electron will have before it collapses in. So the number of orbits, which we'll call lowercase n, is going to be equal to the total amount of energy divided by the change in energy of each orbit. Right? Because if you have, let's say you have a total energy of 5, and let's say that Every time you make an orbit, you lose one joule of energy, which means that you're going to be able to take, after one orbit, you'll have four, four joules of energy left, after another, you'll have three left, and after another, you'll have two left, after another, and so on, which means that you'll have five divided by one is five, and you'll get five orbits. And we're just applying that logic to much bigger, or really uh, smaller numbers. So uh, E over DE, we found E here, 
we found dE, the change in energy, here. Uh, sorry for this notation. Um, this is the calculus notation, but we'll just make it uh, change in energy there. Uh, and that's going to give us that the number of orbits the electron will take before stopping and running out of energy is going to be 281,859. About some decimal places, but I'll ignore those. Uh, so it's a lot of orbits, but it's traveling really quickly. So to do that number of orbits probably doesn't take too long. Um, and now that we have this number, we can actually find out how much that takes. So what we're going to do is multiply n, which is the number of orbits, times the period, and that will give us the total amount of time it takes for the electron to collapse, or for the atom to collapse and the electron to fall into the nucleus. And when we plug in our values for n in the period, and to remind you, the period um, had a value of 2.79 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds, we will get 7.87 times 10 to the negative 11 seconds. That's a really short time. And I told you we were going to be off by a little bit, and in fact we are. The actual uh, answer you'll get, which I'll call tau, uh, this will be called t. Uh, tau, uh, the actual time of collapse, a much better uh, approximation, is actually about 1.05 times 10 to the negative 10 seconds. Uh, so a little bit faster. Um, but when we actually do that out, if we have, let's say we put the actual value, tau, divided by our answer, t, we're only off by a factor of 1.33. So our approximation that the radius doesn't change was actually a very good approximation. Now at this point, you might be asking, well, if atoms should collapse in a billionth of a billionth of a second, then how are we existing? And in fact, this tells us something very profound. It tells us that contrary to what you've been taught throughout all of middle school and high school, electrons do not orbit the nucleus. Let that sink in and think about it. Uh, electrons do not orbit the nucleus. And quantum mechanics actually explains why that is. So I hope you enjoyed that, and you now know how long it takes for a hydrogen atom to collapse according to what you're taught in school. Uh, so you should you know, share that with your friends. Thanks.